There is no solution for me to fix this Asian problem. Oh, that was a bad <laughs> Asian problem. <laughs> Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a two-month free trial of a premium membership, so you can explore your creativity. Flip phones. Do you remember these? Yeah, I don't think they had passwords, let alone fingerprint ID. But nowadays, even fingerprint ID is looking a little low-tech. Instead, more and more people are unlocking their phones and their laptops with their face. And that kind of blows my mind because unlike a fingerprint, my face changes a lot depending on lighting and angles and makeup. So clearly this facial recognition software needs to be flexible, but also there are a lot of people in the world who look like me. I am a very average person. Like how does a computer know that my face is my face? And these questions impact a lot more than a phone password. Every day you hear more and more about governments and private companies using facial recognition in a bunch of different ways. You don't even need to tag Facebook photos anymore. It does it for you. And honestly, it's a little bit terrifying seeing this seemingly inevitable technology and not knowing how it works. So today, in this video, you and I are going to figure out how facial recognition actually works. So I found that the best way to learn is by doing. So we are going to try and make our own facial recognition software, but not just any facial recognition software. No, I want to train a machine to be able to identify the faces I see every day, but can never remember. K-pop idols. Like if you use Twitter, uh, fan cams are kind of unavoidable. They're these videos taken by fans of their favorite K-pop idols or bands dancing or just breathing. The bar is really low. In every trending hashtag or viral tweet reply, you are going to see a fan cam. And while that may be seen as annoying, that same cultish obsession also presents us with this really neat data set. We have a million and one labeled photos of just about every idol in every angle, lighting, quality, and hair color you can imagine. So to get started, I'm just gonna Google how to make a facial recognition software and see where it takes me. Okay, so I think I know how facial recognition works. It's kind of freaky because it seems really simple. Let me explain. Facial recognition is a subset of a larger field of research called computer vision. Computer vision is all about training computers to interpret the visual world. And this is a deceptively difficult task because computers don't see the way we see it. Because technically, they don't see at all. Instead, a computer receives an array of pixel information, numbers that represent the amount of red, green, and blue the pixels contain. But why would that make facial recognition harder for a computer? Well, it isn't necessarily harder. It just hasn't had as much time to develop. Think about it, humans have spent thousands of years training our brains to recognize images, faces especially. When we see something, we immediately start referencing what we've seen before, and we will start projecting those experiences onto what is in front of us. That's how we recognize our friends and how we see faces in pizza slices. It's essentially just an algorithm so fine-tuned that we don't ever need to think about it. In comparison, computers are millennia behind. So for now, we need to split facial recognition into three smaller steps. Finding a face, analyzing key facial features, and identifying the face from a set of known faces. Let's start off with the first step. Now, it's important to note that detecting a face isn't the same as identifying it. Right now, all we care about is finding any faces in the picture. We don't care who it is. Splitting up these tasks saves us a lot of computational energy, so we aren't analyzing every frame and pixel when it isn't needed. So how does a computer actually find a face? Well, a human face is just an object in an image, and researchers have developed a bunch of ways to identify objects. Some of the most popular ones use edge detection, since you can tell a lot about an object by its outline. Now, there are a couple of techniques that exist to detect edges, but we are going to use a histogram of oriented gradients, or an HOG. It's an algorithm that works by breaking down an image into smaller cells. It then analyzes the pixels in the cell for the most intense changes in color or light. If there are enough pixels indicating intense changes, that is a pretty good indication of an edge. The direction and intensity of those changes can be represented with a vector, or an oriented gradient. The algorithm then summarizes all of the oriented gradients in a histogram, tracking the magnitude of common angles. After doing this for every cell, we're left with a really simple numerical 
representation of where the biggest changes in intensity occur in the image and the direction they take on. That is how a computer can see. And if we assume that light moves across any average person's face in a similar-ish way, given the same lighting conditions and angles, then the edges that we can pull from that image and its numerical representation should be pretty similar as well. So, if we have a machine that's already trying to recognize the numerical representation of a face, it should then be able to detect one in an image. So that's the first part, right? I need to figure out how to use a histogram of oriented gradients to detect a face. Now, luckily, I've done a bit of searching and it turns out that there's a bunch of pre-trained models out there that already exist. What that means is that these are machines that have already figured out what the gradients of a face look like. I left the link for it in the description. Basically, it's a bit of a pain in the butt to download, but actually using it is really simple. It has really simple commands. For the coding nerds out there, it's a wrapper for Dlib. Here's my code. She's a bit ugly. Don't judge. Her. So to start testing things out, I just downloaded a bunch of pictures of K-pop idols just to figure out, like, does this even work? Consider this photo of Seventeen, a group with arguably too many people. Look at that. It, it was able to find and detect everybody's face, including two little faces back here in the background, which is freaky because I didn't even notice those faces existed. So once a machine detects a face, what happens next? The machine now needs to analyze key facial features. This is done in two steps. The first step is all about preparing the face so it's as easy to work with as possible. That means trying to minimize the effect of things like perspective and face orientation. Now, there isn't a perfect way to do this. However, by identifying standard landmarks on a face like eyes, nose bridge, and jawline, the machine can try its best to transform the image to try and make it look like it's facing straight ahead. Doing this brings every image to a sort of baseline to simplify comparisons. Now, the machine needs to be consistent and careful not to distort the face too much, so it only uses affine transformations, essentially using scale, rotation, and shear to preserve points and parallel lines. The second step is actually analyzing the face for key features. Now, you might assume that the machine will use all of the information that we have established up until this point, the edges and standard landmarks of your face. But historically, we've found that using those features suck. Think about it, when you're imagining someone's face, certain features come to mind first, and they aren't consistent for every person you imagine. For some people, it might be the way they part their hair. For others, it could be a mole. The machine already knows that it's looking at a face, but now it's trying to figure out how to identify it. That means figuring out what makes a person's face unique. So this is where machine learning really comes in. Essentially, you're trying to minimize a thing called triplet loss. To do that, you give a machine three pictures. A, the person you are trying to identify, B, another one of that person in a different situation, and C, one of a different person. The machine will then try and place measurements so that the measurements of A and B are as similar as possible, while those of A and C are as different as possible. The machine will do this a bunch of different times with different sets of photos until it has a set of measurements to carry out so that they're unique for each person. The process of taking these measurements is called encoding, and the result is an array of numbers called an embedding. The trippy thing is, though, we don't actually know what the numbers in an embedding mean. We don't know what it's measuring, and there isn't even a surefire way to find out. All we know is that if a machine is trained well enough, theoretically, every face should have a unique embedding. Situations like this, where you can see the input and output, but have no way of knowing how the machine gets there, is what researchers call a black box. So the library I downloaded before is also capable of doing this landmark and encoding thing. Again, in just like a really freaky few number of lines, check it out. So this is where you can actually get it to draw landmarks on any face. Uh, you just put in the path to an image and then it'll output a picture. Not only is the machine able to detect these edges, it also knows exactly what the edges are supposed to represent. It knows that this is the jawline. It knows that these are lips. So that process of finding those landmarks and encoding those faces is how the machine is able to figure out what makes a face unique. Um, then what? Well, the final piece of the puzzle is the recognition part of facial recognition, and it's surprisingly easy. We've done all of the hard work in detecting and encoding faces. Now we just need to give our machine a set of known identities to encode their unique embeddings. This way, when we present the machine with a new, unknown face, it can follow the previous steps, get an embedding, compare it against our list of known identities, and select the one with the closest acceptable embedding depending on a threshold we decide. The machine then tells us whose 
face it is. But if there aren't any acceptably close embeddings, then the machine can also tell you if you've got a completely new face from outside of your database. And so that's it. In that surprisingly simple step, everything really comes together. That's how I can make a machine that can recognize who is in a fan cam. So I've played around and I know how all of the specific tools work, but now I need to actually make the thing. Here's how I think it's gonna work. Got a whiteboard. Step one. I need to get a list of K-pop idols. There's probably a Wikipedia article out there. Two, I need to get pictures of those idols' faces. I think that I'm just gonna use like Google images. And step three, I'm gonna encode those images. Oh God, I went from all caps to not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then step four, get some K-pop fan cams, get the machine to identify who's in it. And hopefully it works. Don't want another mac and cheese without macaroni. Those are the steps. Let's do it. I did it. Bang, boy. Okay, so I have like 7,000 uh, pictures. Google got upset at me a few times. I got very good at identifying school buses. Okay, so here's the script that I'm gonna use to actually identify faces. So, gotta find a fan cam. This man came through with like a last minute victory. This had so much more uncertainty than I was expecting. Like I figured that it might get one or two frames wrong, but it got like a lot wrong. Out of all of the frames, the machine only correctly identified the person 25% of the time. Maybe his face was too close. That doesn't sound like the problem, but maybe. I am sad. She's even more confused than before. Good. I thought I was finally gonna have an easy one. The, all of the pieces were falling just perfectly in place, except for the thing that mattered. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do a bit of reading. Give me a second. I got bad news. Oh God, not again. For this video, I've been using this library slash model thing called face recognition. In its description, it's called the world's simplest facial recognition API for Python and the command line. The model has an accuracy of 99.38% on the labeled faces in the wild benchmark. It's easy, it's accurate. So I jumped right into it. Should have scrolled down a little further on the page. Face recognition works well with European individuals, but overall, accuracy is lower with Asian individuals. Big thing about K-pop stars, they're Asian. This machine learned how to identify people using that triplet method. The problem is all of the pictures that it was trained on uh, were predominantly not Asian. And while race isn't a factor in your skills, your abilities, your humanity, uh, it does play a big role in how your face is shaped. People can tell I'm Filipino. Look, look at this. Where's my nose bridge? That's why my glasses are always falling. Devastatingly, this isn't a problem that I can just debug. Fixing it would involve retraining the machine using that triplet method on millions of pictures of Asian faces. I had trouble downloading 7,000, but it did get me thinking. Right? Like this library is using a model that says that it has a 99.38% accuracy rating. Um, I disagree. So what's the deal with machine learning? Is it just burying these problems and pretending they don't exist, that they aren't really big deals? Cause it feels like a really big deal. So instead of just calling it quits, calling this a failure, I, I wanna talk more about that. However, my background is in math and financial economics. It's horoscopes for Wall Street. So I wanted to talk to somebody who cares a little bit more about the sociopolitical impacts of, of these technologies. So I'm gonna call on a friend. Hello. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> it's going good. Hello. I am Taha and I do, I study things. I study social science and I'm your friend. <laughs> so how much do you know about this project that I've been working on? I've mentioned it sometimes, but uh, how much do you really facial know? Facial recognition. That's what I know. It's facial recognition for K-pop stars. I ran into a bit of a problem. The computer's racist, Taha. <laughs> <laughs> What did you do? What happened? <laughs> it just assumes that everybody is like some member of BTS and it's no. not good. As you can imagine, I'm in a bit of a dilemma. There is no solution for me to fix this Asian problem. Oh, that was a bad way to phrase it. Asian problem. <laughs> 
but I kind of really want to know if the only issue with it is just like the machine just needs more training data. So if we give yeah. it more information, is it good then? Yeah, I guess it's like a like a classic like liberty versus security question, right? It's like <laughs> did not learn about yeah. that in my classes. I've learned about this in in my in my classes, but I've not really looked into facial recognition that much. So I guess like I'm gonna go and like. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna leave you to figuring that stuff out. Uh, call me whenever you're ready. Bye. Am I recording? Yeah, now I'm recording. I too am recording. How relatable. <laughs> How did it go, friend? I learned things. I learned all about facial recognition. There are some really wild stories out there. Things are happening. It's <laughs> scary. Right. Okay, sounds a little horrifying. Let's let's jump into it then. What have you learned about f- face recognizing? Um, yeah, so what I found out is there's two basic concerns around machine learning. One comes from bad actors, so that's people using machines in evil ways, and the other comes from bad data. That's machines that are not trained properly and therefore give us unreliable results. One is a badly built tool and the other is a nefarious user. If a bad guy uses a bad tool, then they're just a really useless bad person. And if a good person uses a good tool, they're just doing a good job. The areas we need to be concerned about is when a good person uses a bad tool and when a bad person uses a good tool. So Sabrina, your issue is that um, you've built a tool that isn't working properly because it's been trained on bad data. If you were to give it more Asian faces or just you know, a variety of different types of faces, it would really be able to accurately recognize every face. So it would solve the Asian problem. (laughs) The Asian problem is solved. Okay, so in order to fix an issue like that, we need good data. Explain to me what good data actually means. Yeah, so I found this list of like general things to tick off. So essentially on a technical level, what good data needs is accuracy, completeness, reliability, and relevance. Is the information correct? Are you feeding the machine human faces and not accidentally feeding it pictures of Phineas and Ferb? Is the information comprehensive? Or does it, like in your case, mainly encompass white people? Does the information contain contradictions or oppose trusted sources? With South Korea being the plastic surgery capital of the world and K-pop stars having a lot of work done, can you even identify a K-pop star if their face changes artificially over time? Are you giving it information you need? If you want a machine to recognize faces, you need to make sure you're only feeding it faces. So bad data is basically how you get machine learning algorithms with unwanted bias. You're essentially just reflecting a bias that's already in society. So your algorithm was trained on Western media, which has a disproportionately low Asian population. And that that can have like really troubling consequences. If facial recognition is used in like CCTV footage, you can get false convictions based on that footage. But that's just like a problem with bad data, right? So yeah. as I was talking about before, would everything be okay if a machine just had the face of every single person on earth? Well, n- not really. Because you need to consider how a machine would get access to a face of every person on earth. For example, if you wanted to, Sabrina, you could scrape your Facebook friends list for photos of faces to build a database to train your neural network on. On a broader level, a government or social media company could take all the photos that it has in its database from passports or profiles to use them to develop neural networks. But do those people consent to that? Facebook has billions of photos of millions of people. How would those people feel about having their data used in this way? Maybe they won't care, but even then, they should be given the choice, right? Until very recently, this has been a wild west from a regulatory perspective. Things like the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, try to tackle this issue. Basically, it requires privacy standards to be built in and offered to the user by default, rather than users having to actively protect themselves from having their data collected. The implementation of this has mixed reviews. One of the major issues is opt-in fatigue. Having every site you go to ask to allow cookies means that people are desensitized from consent pages, and they are more likely to just passively accept any and all requests, which can lead to people inadvertently giving data that they may not have wanted to give away. It basically becomes another version of the terms and conditions you never read. I literally do that. I... (laughs) 
let's go to the flip side. You mentioned good data, bad actors, nefarious users. What is that? Yeah, so this is the side that's actually really, really scary. Like this is the one where like reading about it, I got chills. Let's say we can solve issues of bad data and have facial recognition systems that work really well. Its applications are potentially limitless, both in how it could help humanity, but also how it could hurt us. You could use facial recognition to find vulnerable missing people, but you could also use facial recognition to identify who your daughter is going on a date with and find every instance and context of their face online. And that's happened. The actual engineers developing this technology aren't necessarily thinking, I can't wait for creepy dads to use this. But if the technology is available, they're making it a possibility. Fundamental rights are those that are necessary to live life with dignity. The concept of individual privacy has long been considered one of those rights. One of the ways that our privacy is ensured is through obscurity, and in this case, obscurity of identity. If you walk into a restaurant, everyone there is just the background to your life, and you're the background to theirs. Who they are and why they're there is a mystery, but with facial recognition, you could quickly identify and infer why they're there. What's being lost here is a fundamental safety that comes from anonymity in public spaces. Facial recognition could strip that from us and make any and all public spaces irreversibly dangerous. Imagine if everyone you walked past could find out where you worked or where you live. The loss of obscurity can also have wider implications for democracy. It makes it a lot scarier to express yourself without fear of repercussions. This is what's known as the chilling effect. Do you feel better off knowing all of this? I mean, like I was going to say no in my small brain. It, it makes me more anxious, right? But in my big brain, I'm like, oh, now I can now I can actually like engage with this topic if it ever comes up or like if politicians talk about it or whatever, right? So yes and no. Thank you so much. I'm going to end this video right now and just like vibe in the horror of man. All right. Bye. Bye. This video is so much heavier than I expected it to be. It was just supposed to be about Stan Twitter and fan cams. So while making this video, I learned a fair amount about facial recognition. Like for whatever reason, time and time again, we're seeing facial recognition software have higher rates of error for people of color. It could be how cameras work, it could be data, but it just seemed like it was fundamentally fixable. I never really considered the fundamental issues that lie with the technology itself. Like I, a, a pretty big idiot, it, was able to harness the power of facial recognition in just a couple of lines of code. And even though it didn't work properly, and even though my use case was a little silly, the simplicity, the convenience, the ease of use was a little unsettling. All throughout, I was just like, why is this so easy? Because as it stands, facial recognition and computer vision research isn't just gonna stop. The technology is just gonna get better and better and easier to use. And when this product is labeled perfect, even though it technically may not be, and it's packaged and sold, then this power to strip away anyone's obscurity with just a click of a button, it gets sold to the highest bidder. And that, is terrifying. But I guess I'm just torn because I find machine learning to be so cool and technical advancement to be exciting that it, it makes it so easy to forget about the human impact. Like I'm making these videos to make machine learning seem a little bit more accessible to you, but I'm showing all of the fun use cases, the silly use cases, not, not the worst. The only thing I could do is hopefully arm you with enough information to form your own opinion. So what do you think? Do you think facial recognition should be more widely implemented? Or not. Nah. Let me know down below. I've also left some interesting readings in videos uh, to like expand your horizon a little outside of this video. It ranges from like how this technology works to like the impact of it. Now stick around for an ad read cause that's the only way I get to keep making these videos. <laughs> it's editing Sabrina here coming in to say thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. If you're curious and you like learning then you are going to love Skillshare. It's this online learning community with thousands of classes covering just about any skill. From illustration and animation to web development. In fact, a lot of you guys have asked me how to get started in motion design because I have done all of the animations on this channel. Well, let me recommend Jake Bartley. His classes range from fundamental skills to specific effects and they're perfect for motion designers of every level. It's kind of mind-blowing that you can access all of this and more for under $10 a month. 
Even if you're just looking to dabble, Skillshare is still amazing for you. Most classes are under 60 minutes, which means that they can fit any schedule. Plus, they come with hands-on projects so you can take on any creative challenge. I'm a strong believer that the best way to learn is by doing, and I am so glad that Skillshare makes that possible. The first 1,000 people to hit that promo link in the description will get a two-month free trial of a premium membership. So whether you want to explore new skills, deepen existing passions, or get lost in creativity, get started with Skillshare. But either way, have a lovely day!